Today on the show, a disease causes panic and the demonization of a group while exposing the weaknesses of our nation's medical system and the global nature of world health. Does any of that sound familiar? The Ebola crisis certainly looks familiar to people who lived through the AIDS epidemic. We'll talk to one and hear from a co-president of National Nurses United about who is really on the front lines. All that and a new documentary on the radicalism of the 60s U.S. women's movement and a commentary from me on sexist smoke. Act Up Against Ebola is a new activist group that's been mobilizing, drawing on the expertise of those active in the campaign against AIDS. One of those who's been influential in helping this group come together is Anne Christine Dadeski, an old friend of mine, also a reporter, an author who's covered the AIDS epidemic virtually since its start and has been active in working against AIDS in both Haiti, West Africa, and beyond. And Christine Dedeski, welcome to the program. What Thank you. brings you into this Ebola response these days? Well, I think Ebola is yet another uh, disease that is um, really being treated with a lot of media um, sensationalism and, and hysteria, and there, there's such a general public fear. And so we're beginning to see, I think, poor health policy responses. And I'm a longtime AIDS activist, but I'm also a journalist. I've covered AIDS for since really the early days of the epidemic. And while these diseases are different, there are so many similarities in terms of the response to the public fear, uh, in terms of um, the kinds of bad policies we see emerging, and also the opportunities. So it's a great time for lessons of, I think, the AIDS movement to be shared. And I began to see recently discussion on Facebook and others among AIDS activists um, and also feminist health activists who were really just, you know, sounding off about how bad the policies were, the fear, the quarantines, um, the stigma. And I felt like um, it was important to kind of see what were opportunities, what were lessons. So that's where I started mm. from. And since then, um, it's just been a really fast moving ball, partly because the timing of it where we saw these calls for mandatory quarantine in New York and New Jersey. But in my looking at this, I approached some longtime ACT UP activists who I've you know, known and worked with for many years. And for the most part, they're very experienced, very savvy, um, um, folks in terms of both knowing how to do community education, mobilization, knowing how to craft messages, but also they really have learned the global health system and the national public, you know, the national health system. So they're very well placed to be able to see where gaps, where do we need to be able to see how we might influence the public discourse. And really there was consensus on what was missing in some way, which was political accountability. You said there's a gap between messages and reality. What are the overriding messages that people are hearing? I think if you're an average American person watching the news or reading the newspaper or picking up your, you know, your local radio stations, you're seeing a lot of coverage of what's seen as an incredibly scary, fatal, fast-moving virus and disease where you wouldn't possibly even know if someone had it, and it gives you the impression of something totally out of control. The reality is that Ebola is a virus, but it is not airborne. Um, it's even a virus that we found can be cured and treated um, with very well-known measures. So it's not an incurable disease. And the real message should be that if you um, can get to, if you have any concern and you get to services quickly, you're going to be surviving this. It's the opposite of the message we're seeing in the United States, even though we have very few cases here. So um, at the same time, I think that the public Hysteria is partly there because it truly is a disease that is moving so quickly in West Africa. These are three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, and now Mali, who have recovered from civil war, who have very weak health systems, in part because they have so few health professionals. So, 
in the United States, we're really seeing the fear coming from these very brave U.S. volunteers who have gone to these countries to help, to treat, and because they know that there is, they know how to protect themselves. Um, so I think that, you know, it's a shame that instead of celebrating these incredible health workers, we are essentially fearing the very people who are there to protect us, to help us. And the reality, when it comes to curing this disease, what do we know? One of the things that we have learned from the data, from the science, if we just go on the science, is that the people who are maybe exposed to Ebola but don't have any kind of active infection are not, sim you know, not symptomatic, meaning they're not showing any symptoms. They can't actually transmit Ebola. It's not airborne. It's not something where if somebody has been, just been exposed but not sick that, that they can suddenly give you Ebola or touch with it. So we have a very different disease from what is being talked about. And um, I think that the, the other issue is that because Ebola does in fact cause what's known as a hemorrhagic fever, um, it can act very quickly in the absence of treatment, meaning that it really what it causes is almost kind of an incredible dehydration. It, it attacks the gastrointestinal system. So what we have learned and what we've seen these last weeks in West Africa is that if people are given hydration, meaning they're given access to water or oral rehydration salts, which is a kind of packet, like almost like a Gatorade type electrolyte packet, um, and a lot of it, they can counter the effect of the virus and recover. And you have quite a number of people who've recovered and in fact they are now immune to Ebola. So we have not only shown that it can be treated and cured, but it can also be prevented. And that now, the prevention, the fact that all these people have survived, is being looked at for treatment. So one of the big stories that is about to emerge that we'll see in the next few weeks is the looking at how to do trials, clinical trials, of what is called convalescent therapy. And that is essentially taking the blood or the plasma of recovered Ebola survivors and giving it to people who have been exposed. And what we've seen here in the United States is the one or two health workers who got that when they showed and they began to have a fever recovered very quickly. It's not clear whether that's the only thing that cured them because they were given obviously water, they were given other types of care. But what we've seen in, in the field, even in Africa, is that people who are transfusing the blood of survivors are recovering quickly. How did Nigeria manage to stop the Ebola epidemic? And why is that relevant to us? Nigeria uh, really mobilized at the community level. It had only a few cases, but one of the things it did do was look at where did it have public health infrastructure, really community-based. And one place was the polio campaigns that it had run, the polio prevention. So it essentially integrated Ebola messages, Ebola outreach into that. And so part of the AIDS activist response and the health activist response is to say, here in the United States, there, the early lesson of AIDS was to engage in community education, mobilize communities for community responses, and look to see what your resources are at the community level. And so we have great opportunities. And this last week, in the midst of all the quarantine talk, one of the messages that came from West Africa, from field doctors with Doctors Without Borders and others here is, we can look at the disaster of Ebola or we can look at the possibility of Ebola giving us a chance to strengthen the health systems in these countries, to strengthen our own system in terms of readiness and preparedness, the gaps, the information going to communities that are vulnerable. So, that's very much the message that AIDS activists are carrying. For someone who's terrified out there and who doesn't want to go back and look at the experience of AIDS because it just makes them more afraid, what's your message? The first, first most important basis of fear is usually that you don't have the information. You lack information or you're getting information that's not clear to you. So I think that the information about Ebola should reassure us in the sense that if you know how you, uh, you, you, what the risks are, you know that you are likely to be at a very low, extremely low risk. It's not like being on the subway maybe at tuberculosis where somebody might be breathing, like in the United States, or even polio for the number of people who are no longer getting vaccinated for polio in the United States. So um, Ebola is not airborne. It's not, you know, it's not easy to transmit in that kind of way. And the chances of you're sitting on the subway next to somebody who might have been from West Africa uh, you know, in the last week, um, treating somebody who is ill are, are very low. Um, so I think information is the key. Secondly, I think that we've really seen that um, you can move from fear to action when you look at what your own resources are. And I think it's really important to talk to other people. You talked about activism. Anything coming up? So uh, 
the, I think the AIDS activist groups, but others are also really talking about the need to, uh, as a nation, make some noise, be visible, politically accountable. So National Day of Action is being talked about, which might be really just inviting people to all take actions on the same day to really show our solidarity with West Africa, but also what our communities can and want to do. And I think the main thing that I've really heard from everyone is we need to be talking to each other. And that means across movements. So we need the faith communities, we need the African community, we need the diaspora, we need the immigrant communities where, you know, they're seeing borders, you know, opportunities for borders to close. We, we really need to see who has potential to be scapegoated and reach out. So that's the message, the feminist issue, you know, communities. We really see, we need to talk about Ebola as a feminist issue and invite those communities. So I think we'll see that um, as, as one thing. And of course, the engagement at the local level, the municipal level, the state level, to make sure that our communities adopt sane, responsible policies. And that we also engage in this community preparedness and this education. We are responsible for taking this message forward. We have things to say. We have experts in our backyard. Let's use them. Let's speak out. National Nurses United, or NNU, has been in the forefront of the response to the Ebola crisis. Not so long ago, Deborah Berger, co-president of NNU, testified on Capitol Hill. She's been hearing from nurses all across this country about the lack of preparedness in their hospitals. We had a chance to talk about the CDC's new guidelines. They're not enough, says Berger. Here she is. Not long ago, Deborah, National Nurses United began to get calls from nurses who were dealing with Ebola. What's the most remarkable thing you've been hearing? When we got the call from the nurses in Dallas, it was really kind of terrifying um, when they started telling their story and talked about uh, how threatened they felt about coming forward, about wanting to remain anonymous because they were uh, in a precarious situation and then when they started telling what was actually happening in their facility it was really like our worst nightmare. They were having to improvise even though the hospital originally said we're open for business we can take care of Ebola patients. Uh, we found out very quickly that that really wasn't true and nurses were trying to make the best of a really bad situation. If a person who suspects that they may have Ebola walks through the doors of a U.S. hospital today, is that hospital prepared to know what to do? So what's happening in a lot of uh, U.S. hospitals today is the patient uh, comes to the hospital. They don't know that it's a center of excellence. They show up at an emergency room. They're told oftentimes to wait outside. Uh, they have a security person guarding them to make sure they don't come into the hospital. They uh, get a, a response team to come out and try and triage a patient on the outside, outside in the cold, waiting to get care. Um, oftentimes, they're then escorted into an isolation room and um, they're uh, attempting to provide care for that patient uh, through a glass door. So doctors won't even go into the room. Uh, in uh, a number of facilities here where they've had a uh, rule out Ebola, the doctor is on the other side of a glass door doing a phone interview on a cell phone. And do the nurses go in? And the nurses have gone in. They've gotten together gloves, gowns, masks, face shields and try to do what they can, but you have to remember that these nurses are then also putting their lives and their families' lives at risk because they themselves could become a patient infected with Ebola if this patient really had Ebola. If you were a firefighter and you were trying to ask for personal protective gear and you said, I need a fireproof suit to go in and fight a fire, nobody is going to argue with that firefighter and say, you know what, I think fire resistant is actually okay and that's what we're going to give you. And it's because we're women that they think that somehow we're um, expendable and n don't deserve the equipment to keep ourselves safe and protected. What are the nurses calling for? NNU is calling for mandatory optimal standards of personal protection equipment. 
we really feel that that is uh, the gold standard that has to be uh, implemented nationally because there's 5,000 hospitals in the United States and right now it's sort of a patchwork um, and a cafeteria plan almost where you go in and you get one set of boots, one set of scrubs, one set of um, face shields or masks and uh, it's not really optimal for providing care for such an infectious disease. So when we're saying I am Nina Pham, it really meant that as a community of uh, health givers, as RNs, uh, we were all at risk. Uh, because all of our hospitals are really not ready to provide care. Nurses in the U.S. have a long history of dealing with various epidemics, including HIV AIDS. What are the lessons from that experience that you bring to your work here now? It's actually that it doesn't work very well to stigmatize the patient because then they are not getting the care that they need and we're not doing it in a humane, compassionate manner. The CDC's come out with new guidelines. Are they adequate? Do they fit the bill? Some of the guidelines are actually helpful for us. Uh, we appreciate the fact that they've improved and stressed the fact that we do need hands-on training, that it needs to be done multiple times. Having it done just once a year isn't adequate, and handing a nurse a sheet on personal protective gear and how to treat an Ebola patient isn't really education and training. And the other issue that we have uh, is that in the guidelines, one of the not so good things about the CDC's guidelines is that the uh, personal protection equipment, there's an array of uh, equipment that the employer can choose from. It, there's not a strict mandated guideline on what needs to be done. So what we really need to make sure uh, is that these guidelines are mandatory for all 5,000 hospitals instead of this uh, optional pick and choose um, patchwork system. NNU Director Roseanne DeMora was recently on the Chris Hayes Show where she said that the Ebola crisis takes us deeper into the problems with our health system. You want to go deeper? Well, if I was to go in deeper into really the, the challenges of providing uh, health care with all of these infectious diseases, it would really be uh, incumbent upon us to look at how we provide care and prevent the spread of the Ebola uh, epidemic, not only in West Africa, but also how our own healthcare system here is so fragmented and we have people that are already on the edge that aren't getting the care that they need and cost is always a factor. People are more reluctant to come into uh, hospitals in the U.S. because of the cost and what uh, a financial ruin it could be just with one emergency room visit. So we really need to look at how we provide uh, health care and really look at our public health care system because in in reality we do not have a public health care system in this country. What we have in this country as far as health care and a public health care system is a very very fractured and patchwork quilt of profit centers and a health care industry that really isn't meeting the needs of anyone. Thousands of women in the United States are hospitalized each year because of post-abortion complications. 5,000 of these women die. I had a very good friend in high school who went away to college and she subsequently had an illegal abortion and died. So within three or four months of going off to college, she was dead. People tried to self-abort. My best friend took pills and she had the miscarriage in the dorm shower with the turned on really hard, hoping the noise would muffle the, her cries of pain. Some were able to find an abortion. Some had to have the child that they didn't want. All those kinds of experiences we discovered were universal. And abortion became our big unifying issue. We are powerful. Women 
women have a fundamental right to control their own bodies and to control their own lives. Not since the suffragettes fought for the right to vote has an issue been more critical to women than abortion. Somewhere around 1970, I went to an uh, abortion rights rally in San Francisco. And it was a sea of white women, very few women of color. And someone grabbed a bullhorn and asked for the African American women who were there to gather under a tree. And we decided that we would form a group called Black Sisters United. I was very glad that, you know, somebody called African American women together and said, you know, maybe we have something to talk about that might be a tiny bit different from what's coming from the stage. And indeed, we did. I was invited up to Harlem to speak at a event around abortion. Remember, in the Black Liberation Movement, the big debate is abortion is genocide, women should have babies for the revolution. And I remember going up those stairs and my knees were literally knocking because this was a bunch of nationalists and I was really scared. I concentrated a lot about the deaths of black women as a result of illegal abortion and how we should be able to choose when we want to have children. So I managed to survive, you know, some of the attacks and on my way out, twice it happened. One woman said to me, whispered to me, thank God you speak up. Thank God you're speaking up. And another, as I was approaching the door, said, right on. The Hillary Clinton Nutcracker reappeared this week. A blonde plastic doll with steel-lined legs, the stupid sexist toy came to retail stores amid a slew of post-midterm news stories that repeated all boring guff about the Democrats' age, her health, her ambition, her looks, and sent Team Clinton into high dudgeon, of course. In the months ahead, the Clinton camp may want to take note and stockpile those nutcracking dolls, if only to distract voters from more serious issues. Whenever the stench of sexism is in the air, it's natural for feminist hackles to rise. And that works for Hillary Clinton. But before so much misogynist mud is thrown, the progressive voters can't see straight. Can we remember that there are plenty of models of valiant feminist leadership out there that in contrast to Clinton don't involve waging war, protecting Wall Street, and flacking for the world's biggest corporations? Take two women who were honored in Washington on the same day the Nutcracker somehow made it into the news. Former financial regulator Brooks Lee Bourne and Jobs with Justice director Sarita Gupta. Just over a decade ago, when she headed up the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, Bourne tried to regulate financial derivatives before they had a chance to blow up the U.S. economy. Cassandra-like, she saw the writing on Wall Street's wall and was ignored, belittled, and driven out of her job by the very same Larry Summers and Robert Rubin, who went on to be such close Clinton allies. If Brooks Lee Bourne were running for nomination, she'd no doubt be getting her fair share of sexist grief, but without the six-figure speaking fees reportedly coming to Clinton from Goldman Sachs. Sarita Gupta is a longtime crusader for women's rights. To her, wages and trade rules are as much women's issues as the right to a safe legal abortion. Gupta's taken on her share of fights, among others suing Walmart over the exploitation of its drive-to-the-bottom global supply chain. A very different sort of feminist from Gupta, Clinton served on the board of Walmart. She's rarely seen a trade deal she didn't like, and as Secretary of State, she promoted the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the most far-reaching trade pact ever. Sex is smoke. It has a way of getting in feminist eyes. Fair enough. But while there's every reason to think Hillary Clinton can handle a steely-thighed doll, surely the women of the world deserve better than another presidential race in which people who know better line up behind a Clinton candidacy. For more, you can write to me, laura at grittv.org, and tell me what you think. Thanks.
The center of gravity of the movement was grassroots organizing, was frontline communities, was alliances between um, communities of color, indigenous communities, working class white folks. Like you saw a different face of the movement. We see this as a growing movement around systems change, not climate change. We've had this beautiful campaign by the registered nurses who brought to the public awareness that there was a problem and that actually they had a, a solution in great part to the problem and that was the question on the contagion of Ebola. The, ner the registered nurses had a campaign, they talked to everyone they could possibly talk to, the nation, and they